One of the things I thought about when I walked in and watched Bob talk is how on earth am I going to make the segue from conduct disorder to OCD? And I think this is an easy way to do it, which is my kids are the people who are afraid to do what the kids that Bob treats actually do. So we had a lot of kids who were afraid that they're going to become serial killers. I'm treating a 17-year-old girl right now who's afraid she's going to become a rapist. And I get to teach kids about the difference between possibility and probability. It's comfort in math is what I tell kids. And kids don't understand that until we start talking about things like base rates. No, I don't think you're going to become a rapist. I have no guarantee that you won't, but I like your odds. That's, that's the message I'm trying to get across to these kids, OK? So this is the science -y talk. I've got a workshop um, in the afternoon. We're going to talk about nuts and bolts of treatment. I've really cut that piece down a lot so I can show you what the literature says um, and, and what the evidence base is for these kinds of treatments. And maybe that'll help uh, compel people to try them. So disclosure stuff. I need my CVS reading glasses to say what I've said. Um, people who've supported us, people who've um, been behind the work that we've done, very much appreciated. And I will leave it at that. Now, these are people who are related to one another, also related to me. Uh, one of the things I thought about when I was uh, coming to give this talk is I would love it if we could put kids back in the circumstance where they're back to irritating their siblings and having a good time and focusing more on what kids should be focusing on rather than unwanted and intrusive thoughts and repetitive behaviors. One of the things I've seen with kids with OCD for a long time is that they tend to uh, become isolated from their families a bit. Uh, they're, when people walk on eggshells around them, they tend to get excluded because the siblings don't want to deal with them. And I'd like to get them back to the circumstance where clearly what's happened in this is my son has said or done something socially inappropriate, and my daughters are reinforcing him for it. <laughs> so basic facts, it is indeed a low base rate disorder, 1 to 2%. Uh, there tends to be a gradual onset with some waxing and waning. If you've got perfectionism related to academics, guess what? Your summers are much better. So kids can look like they're doing better, and then you send them back to school again and get the same thing. So you get some of that stuff that's related to the context in which they find themselves. Um, OCD tends to be associated with other anxiety disorders, some externalizing comorbidity, samples we've done. It's been looked at anywhere from 10 to 20%. The most common externalizing problem is ADHD, but we also do have kids who have um, uh, problems with authority, and sometimes that's specific to their OCD, and sometimes it's not. And those are complicated cases. Uh, there's quite a bit of ODD, and certainly a lot of tantruming. So the stuff that Bob was just talking about is extremely relevant to teaching parents who sometimes walk on eggshells around their kids and let them run the roost and don't, re don't discipline them for anything. And the kid winds up having whole heck of a lot more power than they probably want or need. OCD is associated with moderate to severe functional impairment. Um, I, I view myself, my, my career started working with adults. And I still actually think my focus is on adults. But, but what I'm really trying to do is by working with younger and younger and younger people, I'm trying to prevent adult psychopathology and comorbidity. And I, we'll be down to the zygote soon enough. We've, we've done a study of eight, kids ages four to seven, which I'll talk about today. Um, <clears throat> disruptions in academic and social achievement often drive treatment. These are sometimes teachers' pet until they can't hand in the thing because it's, it's not perfect, um, or until they just come off the rails and can't go to school anymore. Some of this stuff gets reinforced. And so, you know, people being fastidious. Have you ever been to a school recently, to the cafeteria? At least 20%, at least maybe even 30%, have that giant dispenser of Purell. It's like, for my kids, that's really, that's gas on a fire. I should have taught many, many kids how to pretend to put on Purell. Because I don't want them putting on Purell. And yet, the whole school sometimes is reinforcing these kinds of messages about safety. The Ebola outbreak was very, very good to us. Because <clears throat> we had a lot of cases come in. And often, it was kids we'd already treated. And so kids coming back for booster sessions saying, but my school saying, you know, we, we have to take these precautions. I don't care what your school says. Learn how to fake it. So I'm teaching them to be some of Bob's kids a little bit. Be a little sneakier about this stuff. OK. What do we have in the way of initial treatment? Got quite a bit. I'm starting with med. 
med is, I mean, OCD in particular has been medicalized, and oftentimes we get a lot of referrals from the psychiatrists and also from the GPs. GPs are doing a whole heck of a lot more of this um, identification process than we are comfortable with. They're doing less treatment than they used to. I'll, I'll explain why I think that is. Uh, but meds are pretty commonly the first thing because OCD is considered a biological illness. Now, I can't tell the difference between OCD and some of these other conditions that Anne Marie talked about. Certainly, there's biology involved in all of them. We're not going to have that argument, are we? But at the same time, you know, how one conceptualizes this may influence what kind of treatment you get first. So, SSRIs and, and an aphrodinal to an extent. Uh, which affects serotonin. Uh, summary of that literature, I don't want to bore you with these studies, but they're consistently superior to fake medicine, which is good. If you don't beat fake medicine, you need to retire. So some of these medicines are better than fake medicine. Uh, Multi-site randomized control trial, 200 plus in the sample, randomized to med versus no med typically, and they do pretty well. If you stay on the medicine, the trials are typically 8 to 12 weeks, it's a pretty short time. But if they keep kids on the medicine, generally speaking, what they've found is they maintain their gains. They're also readily available. I mean, I think they're harder to get now than they were uh, 10 years ago because of the black box warning, which we'll talk about in a sec. Uh, but you can get somebody to prescribe an SSRI for your kid. And so it makes this access issue easier. The downside of the med literature is that residual impairment is the norm. So if you come in with moderate to severe OCD, by the time you're done with a good med trial and you've had, you've had the average med response, you still have at least moderate OCD. So now you're left with the question of what now? So I've gotten them better, somewhat. It's affected some of the comorbidities, perhaps, so I don't want to take them off it, but now where am I in terms of what I do next? Because I still have enough symptoms to warrant inclusion in the very med trials that just came out of. Now what? We also have some kids who just don't respond. Uh, to adequate doses. We've got some kids who can't get to an adequate dose because they have side effects. So you have dose-limiting side effects, limiting the number of kids for whom an initial trial of med will be helpful. The med trials that have been done also that have looked at double-blind discontinuation would, in, would suggest that um, you lose your gain if you come off your med. So that's another reason to think, huh, this is not adequate. I don't want to tell an, a nine-year-old that he needs to be on medicine until he's 78. Right? We have no idea the effects of that. Any psychiatrists in this room? My CVS glasses is not telling me there are any. Well, I, that's one thing they struggle with. On the one hand, I want to keep the kid on the medicine that's helping them function. On the other hand, I don't want to commit to a long-term strategy with something that we really don't have a lot of information about. The black box warning, slightly increased suicidal ideation rate on kids with medicine compared to, no, to fake medicine. Uh, this, this is mainly depression trials. There were some anxiety trials included in that data examination 10 years ago. What's happened, though, is psychiatrists, certainly GPs are referring more to psychiatrists, and psychiatrists are being more cautious with putting kids on medicine, which might sound like a good thing, except if you have a condition that might respond to medicine and you don't have an alternative. Now I'm depriving kids of treatment for, and, and the, the rate of, of increase in suicidal ideation in the, in the FDA examination of those, of those treatments was a 3% versus 1.5%. But with samples large enough, those of you who are in graduate school realize that you can find a spurious outcome if you have a very, very, very large sample. So we have this issue, and, and, and you know, people are cautious, it's understandable, the, the FDA is pretty clear about this, uh, but at the same time now that le leads to a conundrum and maybe a potential opportunity for those of us who do things other than medicine. So, CBT. I'm going to spend three hours talking about this this afternoon, and that's, I'm not even going to scratch the surface. I could spend three, I just spent three days in Norway, three days uh, looking at this and talking about this with uh, some folks in the National Implementation Program, which I'll talk about in a minute. Three days won't even touch it. So now I have about three slides. I'm going to do the best I can to cover it. Let's see if I do okay. Now, those of you who are uh, learning theory enthusiasts might recognize this as Maurer's two-factor theory, 1939 and 1960. Uh, it's okay if you don't recognize it as Maurer's two-factor theory. 
probably why my eyes are going. Um, what I'd say is this. Um, obsessions give rise to anxiety. Uh, I use distress to cover this more broadly, discomfort. So a person has an unwanted thought, then the kid feels uncomfortable with it, feels anxious, and now they're stuck with that. I have thoughts, now I have anxiety, I want to do something to get rid of it. And in OCD, there's a, with, with every anxiety disorder, there's some effort to avoid. With OCD, there's this much more active process, what we call compulsions. Repetitive behaviors or mental acts that you engage in in order to reduce anxiety and get rid of thoughts. So people do that. And the problem with that is, of course, it kind of works. So if I touch the podium and I think, how do I know this little spot here is not human saliva, right? Now I start to worry, oh, I got human saliva on me. What am I going to do? I'm going to put my hands in my pocket and rub the inside. Now I'm better. So now I have temporary relief. Now I'm going to avoid that spot at all costs. So what I just got was basically negative reinforcement. The bad feeling went away or went down. I wouldn't say away. It's not they're rarely that good. But it goes down. And now the next time I'm in that situation, the next time I touch the saliva spot, what am I going to want to do? Yeah. Wash, avoid, rub off, etc. And now I get into this vicious cycle. And that's the whole problem with OCD. So the treatment essentially comes down to this. I want to stop them from doing their compulsions. I want to stop them from avoiding. So basically, I want you to have your unwanted thoughts. I want you to be uncomfortable and be anxious and do nothing about it. So from a salesmanship perspective, this is not easy. Kids coming in washing 25, 30 times a day, I'm telling them I want to go touch the dumpster outside of my office, and now we're going to go have lunch. What? So you got to also say that's a gradual process. That, that's this afternoon. But this is the process. This is what I want to do. It's, it's actually pretty simple. Don't ritualize. Don't avoid. Let the obsessions go. Don't make them go. You shove them out the door, they're coming in the window. Whatever method you want to use to get that across. I have another method. Maybe this will stick with you, too. My now 19-year-old who mastered this tone a long time ago. I was off to give a three-day workshop up in Boston, and she was absolutely beside herself because I was going to miss her soccer game. And she's very athletic, has always been, still is, and that's just unacceptable, <laughs> simply unacceptable. So I explained this to her. I uh, had some trepidation doing so. And then basically she said to me, sort of out of, out of the blue, she says, three days? I said, yeah. I said, and with the hands, she has a thing we call the dismissive squint. She has a hand gesture that I've only seen in the mirror. So she looks, she squints, and she goes, it's going to take you three days to teach people what you know? And this is why I'm a pretty good parent for, for teenagers, is because I don't respond to tone. I ignored it. I said, yes, actually, it's quite complicated. And she says, no, it isn't. I said, if you did it in one sentence, you could come back after the first day, and you wouldn't miss my game. <laughs> and then I did something I do frequently now, too, is I fell into her trap. I said, what sentence would that be? This is her sentence. And in, in the moment, I realized that, that my entire academic career <laughs> had been summarized by a six-year-old in one sentence. <laughs> and you know what? She's right. <laughs> and sometimes, I'll, when I'm explaining this treatment to kids, I actually bring this slide up. And I say, you know, one of your own people actually said this in a simpler way. <laughs> I had one little girl who was like 10. She reads it. She goes like this. She goes. Yes, one for us. Stop talking at me. Let's just go do it. Good. What do we want to do? Afraid of snakes, you need snakes, right? Afraid of blood, we need blood. Afraid of intrusive images of stabbing your classmate to death? Guess what we need? Do we need to stab your classmate to death? <laughs> That's a different issue. No, we do not. But we need you to 
permit yourself to let that thought be there and not fix it. That's what we need. So this is tricky stuff. An OCD is heterogeneous. You've got a lot of different presentations, but that's the bottom line. What are they afraid of? Let's systematically go do it. That's what we're doing. And three hours after this afternoon, hopefully people will have a better idea of how we structure that. This will have to suffice for now. This is what CBT is for kids with OCD. Figure out what they're afraid of, have them reduce and eliminate rituals, and have them confront those situations. And have them do it a little bit over the top, which we'll get to in a minute when we talk about the therapist effect. We have a decent evidence base. We have a gazillion, maybe three dozen, randomized controlled trials in adults. We've got about 14 or 15 uh, CBT published randomized trials that include comparisons to, to act, active medicine, individual and family CBT versus wait list. We've got the three POT studies, which I'll talk about in detail because they're big. Um, intensive versus weekly presentations. Eric Storch has looked at that, found no difference. Uh, pure behavior therapy, where we don't really talk about cognition at all versus wait list. That did pretty well. We've got brief and full, full cognitively oriented treatment versus wait list. We had a nice study uh, by Passantini in 2011 and one that Freeman did earlier looking at CBT versus relaxation, anxiety management strategies. Because guess what? Anxiety management parent strategies are preferred by parents. Makes sense, right? Can you give him some techniques so he can be less anxious? And in a minute, I'll explain why I don't want to do that. Okay? So, <clears throat> what do we have? CBT is efficacious relative to all those things. Those are all positive trials. There's a range in terms of symptom reduction, but the symptom reduction generally is robust. 50% symptom reduction on average. Some studies are higher. Uh, the studies have included follow-up. There's a number of those, a couple in Australia, one uh, Eric Storch did here in Florida, attesting to the durability of treatment gains over the course of a year, two years, and now I think Barrett's got five-year out outcomes. And they're all, they all look pretty good. They make and maintain lasting progress, the majority do. The majority get better and the majority maintain their gains. You've got relapse issues and we'll talk about that as we go too. The downside of CBT is refusal. I got kids who say, are you kidding me? I'm afraid of making mistakes on tests and you want me to not study for tests? You want me to do things wrong intentionally? You want me to, to mess up? I'm not doing that. I'm afraid of getting an illness and you want me to go touch stuff in the bathroom? Yeah, I do. I sit on the bathroom floor and have roll grapes across. I know, I, I always get some, the medical students. That, whenever I do the first year medical students, at least one of them looks like they're going to pass out when I do that. <laughs> like this, the, the disgust face. Which is telling me if you're going to do this kind of treatment, you've got to get rid of the disgust face. How would you get rid of the disgust face? You do a ton of exposure before you do this. Exposure works. Simple. Afraid of something, go do it. Repeatedly. If it's not inherently dangerous, you'll probably get used to it. Okay? The other issue is the problem of finding expertise. It's not easy to find this kind of expertise. A lot of people say they do CBT. I had a kid come in once and she's got a bunch of uh, what looked like uh, hair ties on her wrist, and I was hoping they were hair ties. So I said, so you've had prior CBT, have you? Yeah. What did your therapist tell you to do? Well, every time I get one of those scary thoughts, I'm supposed to snap this rubber band on my wrist. Like, I want to get up at that point and bash my head against my file cabinet. Because <laughs> that's probably an OCD induction technique. That's not going to help you. It's going to make you worse. Right? You're, you're, you're basically colluding with them and trying to shove stuff out the door. It's not going to work. Don't do it. And don't let them do it. Have them understand the difference between CBT that involves leaning into the fear versus CBT that involves leaning away. If you're leaning away from the fear, you're colluding with the OCD. Okay? But that's not easy to find. Combined treatment. We've got two treatments that work pretty well. We ought to be able to put them together and get something better, right? Because we have good but not perfect response and there are limitations uh, beyond partial response for each of them. Medicine, you've got side effect issues, and you've got anxiety, high anxiety during CBT, if you can imagine doing what I just said. Maybe combined treatment will be better. So let's see what we have. 
First, I want to introduce you to this instrument very, very quickly. This is the primary outcome for OCD trials that have been done in the last 30 years, maybe 40 years. Obsessions and compulsions evaluated separately on how much they occupy a patient's time, how much they interfere with functioning, how much subjective distress is caused, how much they resist, and how much they actually can control obsessions and compulsions. It gets a little tricky because I don't want them controlling obsessions, but a pretreatment is a pretty good measure. It ranges from 0 to 40. It's almost impossible to find somebody who has a 0 on the psi box. You go on a college campus in October, the average psi box is about a 4. So everybody, it's ubiquitous. How many people have had an intrusive thought in the last week? How many people are not really thinking about whether they had an intrusive thought in the last week? <laughs> what I say is, is 80 to 90 percent have had an intrusive thought, and the other 10 percent to 20 percent are lying. Everybody, everybody. You know, you're not sure you put, turn the oven off, you're not sure you locked your car. That counts. It's ubiquitous. So you don't get zeros. I don't believe, when, I, when somebody tells me there is zero, I don't believe them. I'm skeptical. But single digits are where you want to be. That's a subclinical score. You got mild OCD, 10 to 18 on this thing. Typical study entry criteria is 16 for kids and 18 or 20 for adults. So 18 to 29 is moderate OCD. When you see a 30 on this instrument, you're looking at somebody who's not functioning very well. If they're a kid, they're probably not in school. That's really impaired. That's like devoting most of your waking hours to worrying about things and trying to fix it. So I want to keep that in mind as you go. Now, this is an adult study. We can learn stuff from the adult literature. This is a, compa a comparison of uh, intensive, two hours a day, five days a week for a month. Boot camp for OCD. Exposure-based boot camp, essentially. Versus clomipramine, which is a tricyclic antidepressant with serotonergic properties, versus their combination, versus fake medicine. And what you see with fake medicine, what you always see with fake medicine in OCD, sometimes you don't see this in other disorders, anxiety disorders, you see pretty flat line. Not a lot of change. Very little placebo responding in OCD, which actually makes it easier to find treatment effects. But you do get an effect for clomipramine. So the blue line starts around week 8 and maintains to week 12. So it's better than fake medicine. But what you also see is that the intensive exposure uh, is better than clomipramine, and intensive exposure plus clomipramine are absolutely no different from each other. Nothing. And what you see is it's done in four weeks. You see that all that treatment effect is, is driven in the first four weeks. I did a lot of these treatments myself. This is tough. By the end of the first week, Edna Foa and Michael Kozak would want to know if I've reached the top of the hierarchy. And they, they were not inquisitive. They were basically telling me, you better have reached the top of the hierarchy. And if you haven't, you need to explain yourself to us, which was anxiety provoking. But I got used to it, right? like you will. So this study basically says no combined treatment effect, but intensive exposure is pretty darn good treatment. When we look out to follow up, the, the folks who did behavior therapy or combined treatment maintain their gains, and the folks who were discontinued from clomipramine tended to lose their gains. So that's not shocking either. So that's, that's an initial treatment. So from the adult literature, we can say we have a combined treatment effect that seems like the OCD combined treatment is better than medicine, but not necessarily better than CBT alone. Depends on the studies. That's just one study. There's probably 10 of them. Uh, but combined treatment in adults appears to be dependent on how you do it and how often CBT was delivered. So the more intensive your treatment, the more likely you are to get that kind of good outcome. And how you did it matter too. If I told people to try to cut, do the best you can to cut back on your rituals, as opposed to, we're going to do everything on earth to get rituals to zero. And every time you walk in my office, I'm going to ask you what rituals you did, and I'm going to really encourage you to get this to zero. I want you to live your life as if you don't have OCD. That's a different kind of message. And that different kind of message is associated with different kinds of outcomes. So the boot camp seems to work pretty well. So we also have an issue here, which is sometimes these combined treatment studies use simultaneous starts rather than sequential design. So medicine started at the same time CBT did. You might think that you'd start medicine first, and maybe you get a combined treatment effect that way. So that's a, a question that's been looked at. I'll get to you in a minute. 
So we have treatments that work. Fake medicine doesn't work. Sitting around doesn't work. Snapping rubber bands doesn't work. I don't know if it makes you worse, but it doesn't work. We've got CBT, exposure-based CBT. We've got SSRIs, and we've got combined treatment for adults. And, and, and also now, let me show you some kid data. So we fuss with this. Same lab, same people. Uh, this was John March at Duke and Henry Anna Leonard at Brown, our collaborators and principal investigators in the POTS-1 study. So it's basically the same design I just showed you in adults, except for one slight difference. It's actually two differences. One is we use sertraline instead of clomipramine. And the second difference is we used a weekly CBT. Because we felt like we wanted to test something that could be done in the real world. Because to tell a clinician that you need to see this kid two hours a day, five days a week for a month to get a good outcome, it doesn't match my schedule very well. So we, we took a practical angle to this one. And I'll show you what we got. These are the protocols, March and Mule, and then an update, which is, I think, a little more friendly in terms of the language that the clinicians are going to share with the patients and the parents. The first one reads more like an academic text, which essentially it is. So POTS-1, I'm not going to belabor this. We had a nice, even split with gender. Mean age of the kids was about 11 and a half, full range of 7 to 17. Roughly half were little guys and half were adolescents. Uh, ethnicity on this trial, 93% Caucasian. Unfortunately, that is the case in every single OCD trial done in this country. It's a mess. And the base rates in the, in the, in the EPI studies are, are suggesting comparable base rates. But we're having problems getting African Americans in particular to come to these trials. It's an ongoing issue. But we, we, in the same clinic, social anxiety trials, PTSD trials, we don't have that problem. So it's an ongoing issue to be addressed. So that's the sample. Here are the outcomes. Change the graph on you a little bit. So fake medicine is blue. Not a lot of response to fake medicine. Combined treatment is orange. That's a pretty darn good response. The post-treatment cybox is about a 10, which is really good. This is 112 kids, 28 per cell, I think. And what we have here, which is a little bit of a surprise, sertraline and combined treatment, both, uh, sertraline and CBT alone, both worked, but they were comparable. A little bit of a higher pretreatment score in the CBT alone group, but they wound up in the same place. So they got better, but not, not as well as we would have thought. Certainly not as well as we got them in the intensive adult trial. But it leads you to wonder. And we wondered aloud. So when you cut it this way, who has an excellent response? Now you're starting to see an advantage for CBT. So almost 40% versus 21%. In, in the monotherapies. So you start to see, a, so if you're gonna get a good response, you might wanna do CBT. And CBT and combined treatment, you see a stepped function here, but they're not statistically different on this analysis. And one poor kid in placebo somehow managed an excellent response. It, it happens sometimes, I've seen it. Just not that common. So now this all seems like a story that's cutting in a certain direction. Combined treatment effect, right? Seems like it. We leaning in that direction? Well, let me mess up your day. We ran this analysis and messed up all of our days, many days, until we came, we came to accept it and come to grips with it. This, Emery mentioned this this morning. When you're running a multi-site trial, you do not wish to see that graph. Yikes. These are effect sizes. So bigger effects are better, placebos taken out, you get a slight home court advantage for medicine at Duke. They're the, they're the medicine site. Combined treatment was really, real, an effect size of one, a between subjects effect size of one is huge. So combined treatment was fabulous. But now look at, look at CBT alone. What happened? That's probably the only thing we've ever beaten Duke at. I know in basketball, Penn always gets routed by Duke. So what happened here? It's the same protocol. It's the same kids. We looked at whether the kids were more severe. It wasn't that. We looked at comorbidity. It wasn't that. It's a mysterious outcome. And every side effect you see is driven by therapist effects when you have multiple therapists in a trial. So now we're starting to find it a little bit. Look at therapists one and six. The treating kids to the ground. 
They're starting out with kids with Y boxes, of severe Y box. Look at, look at number six. Severe cases getting into the ground just about. Two therapists standing out. Everybody else was doing okay. 40, 50% symptom reduction. Not bad, consistent with all the other trials, but these two were doing something. We're actually doing it. Brown is looking at every tape we've done over the whole cycle of the POT studies, trying to find out what, it, what, what were they doing, what were they not doing. Let's try to figure this one out. Now, my sense of it is this. There's a difference between doing exposure and doing above-the-top exposure, right? So if I'm treating someone with contamination fear, I can have them touch things that are icky, right? Touch the spot. Try not to wash your hands for a while. When I do exposure, the way I was taught to do exposure is this. So you load up, see if I can do this. Bottom of the shoe. Oh yeah, <laughs> medical student back there. I load up, I get my water. Ready? No. Cheers. I had a kid in my office recently who was afraid of the devil. That if I had a negative thought, the devil would make it come true. He's 10. So as an exposure, I had him try to kill me with his thoughts. I said I'd prefer spontaneous human combustion that's more dramatic. <laughs> it also would, it would, it would exclude the fact that I'm a middle-aged man who just happened to drop dead in the next five minutes. We do that sometimes. So I begged him, we begged God to kill me. We put a time limit on it. God had about five minutes to kill me. Spontaneous, I even moved my chair back. So I don't want to burn you. Like hopefully the flames will go straight up. <laughs> I had him by the door. Like you, you know, you just, if, if, once it starts, just go. I'm going to be gone in about 10 <laughs> seconds. So the kid sat there like this. And we tried everything, everything we could do, nothing. I had him come take my temperature, nothing. What do you make of it? So that's exposure to me. If exposure is writing, I hope bad things happen, that's exposure too, but it's not that. So one of the things that we took out of this is we got to get people to think more like th therapist one and therapist six. So when we changed, we changed our supervision approach. We tried to make it more, um, let's be ambitious. We're climbing Everest. We're not climbing hills. We're going to get the worst thing done. I tell people it's like Frank Sinatra, New York, New York. If I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. Like if I can do the exposures in this office. And you know where else you see this? Coaching. Right? There's a fellow who plays. Um, I think it's Tampa Bay, actually. Uh, Evan Longoria, he was injured. And so what they had him doing when he was injured, he was out there practicing, getting himself ready, was having, him, having tennis balls thrown at him at 115 miles an hour to hit. It's an overcorrection. Because by the time you get in to see a major league pitcher throwing 95, which not every, all of them can, and then throwing a giant baseball, it's going to be much easier. So that's, that's, that's the, the view I take. And if I have kids who play sports and I have kids who play music, I can get that analogy pretty well put in. So keep these things in mind for this afternoon, those of you who are coming. So can we manualize these things? We can supervise around them. I don't know if we can manualize them. Uh, but these all came with close, and we've also had two sim similar uh, designs, pot studies with three sites, and we've not had a site effect since. So since we changed the supervision model, we're all shooting for the same kinds of uh, levels of exposure and being ambitious, side effects have dropped out. All right, so let's talk about partial response. Those are initial treatments. The reality in OCD is I got kids who come in and they're already on medicine. So now what? So this is a now what study. This is a now what study in adults. Stress management therapy, which people with OCD like. Give me some things to make me feel better. 
I'll do breathing, I'll do some other kind of deep muscle relaxation, I'll do yoga, I'll stand on my head, whatever. Just don't make me go confront something, right? Guess what? Doesn't work. Got to go confront something. Wasn't as effective as exposure. This is twice a week exposure done with adults. They did another study. No psychiatrist, right? Because the psychiatrists, they don't like this slide, which I completely understand. Because there's data suggesting augmentation with Risperdal is effective in OCD. Small trials that came before this one. This study, I think, puts the last coffin nail in that as an approach. Absolutely no difference between Risperdal augmentation, that comes with a whole heck of a lot of side effects, versus fake medicine. Nothing. I mean nothing. And you compare that to twice a week CBT, and you see substantial differences both in response and in remission. So moral of the story is if you have somebody who's already on an SSRI, instead of adding another medicine, Risperdal in particular, an atypical neuroleptic, you ought to get them some CBT quickly. These are adults. So we did it with kids. You can see there aren't a ton of new ideas, right? What they do with adults? Oh, let's try that with kids. There's a little bit of nuance, but that, that's really what we do. We just steal other people's ideas. So this is kids on medicine already. So they're on adequate dose and duration of medicine. The right, which is essentially the placebo condition, is stay on your medicine for 12 weeks, MM, medication maintenance. On the right is we're going to add the full dose of CBT, 14 sessions over 12 weeks, the ver version we tested in POTS 1. And we're comparing that to a brief form of CBT that's actually delivered by the psychiatrist. It was a practical issue. We thought, well, if the psychiatrists are seeing them first, we might as well give them a shot with some techniques that might produce better outcomes. It's a brief CBT. So how do we do? If you want the excruciating details, they're published in this online journal out of Germany. I'm sure it's readily accessible on your coffee table. <laughs> we had a little bit of an older sample, 13 and a half, which makes sense because they've had to have a med trial first. Uh, we did have the full range, 7 to 17. Percent of the sample younger than, uh, than 11, uh, younger than 12, is only 32%. So it's an older sample, which makes perfect sense given who you're looking for. Uh, despite great efforts, we had the same exact issue we had in POTS 1 with uh, representativeness. So the generalizability of these outcomes to minority samples, we just can't speak to yet. Kids came in on reasonable meds at reasonable doses for a reasonable amount of time. These were not under-medicated kids. That was a criticism we were worried about. If you have a kid come in in five milligrams of Prozac, well, maybe they're not responding to five milligrams of Prozac, but they would have responded to 40. Well, these are reasonable doses. We're not get, we were not savaged by that criticism. Outcomes, um, how would I put this? Um, staying on medicine wasn't associated with much. That's the black line. CBT got us about what we would expect, almost exactly the same thing it got us in the augmentation trial with adults. About an 11-point reduction on the Cybox, but still 14, 15 on the Cybox to end, so not as good. It may be something about being on medicine for a long period of time. Maybe it's pessimism that you're not as responsive as a kid who's never had a treatment before. But we also didn't find much with the, um, the brief CBT. It didn't separate statistically from uh, just staying on medicine. So it was a, a dissemination failure, I guess is the way I would put it. On the other hand, it, it also speaks to the need to, to do full dose CBT with everybody. When you cut it by excellent response, fewer excellent responders in the combined treatment that we got in the other study, but almost nothing in the other two conditions. <laughs> so very quickly, we've got combined treatments. Um, are efficacious. We have combined treatment better than monotherapy in some circumstances, but not all. Um, we see the advantage of adding CBT, um, but the brief CBT was not useful. All of this collectively speaks to the issues POTS 1 and POTS 2 argue forcefully for dissemination efforts. We know what works. 15 trials, dozens and dozens of OCD trials, it's time to get it out there. So one very brief foray before I move to dissemination. Little kids, the, the lower age range here was seven in the, in the trials I just showed you. 
and I, pretty much every trial has been done except these. This is our goal. I want a kid to come back filthy from the woods, not, not walking around like he's just scrubbed for surgery, not unwilling to go to the woods because there might be stuff in the woods. This is what we're looking for. His, his facial expression is, is the dependent variable, okay? Young kid, manual, who is designed to be much more parent-based and to change the language so little kids could understand it. And there is information here for parents and kids. There's some child tools, there's some parenting tools, family process issues, especially around accommodation. So if you don't let your kid get in touch with things that make them anxious, you're going to have an easier morning, but you're now going to have a kid who's got more OCD. Accommodation. Right, so we won't eat in this restaurant because you know because the the forks are too dirty. Or you can bring your own silverware to the restaurants, that kind of thing. Little things like that that add up to a bunch of accommodation that leave the kid in a position where they don't learn what we want them to learn. So this is CBT versus relaxation stress management. This is the only trial I've ever done in my entire career where parents were bitterly disappointed to be randomized to the active treatment. Everybody was rooting for relaxation. I think a direct quote that sort of stuck, stuck out for me was, can't we give poor Sweetie some things to make him feel better? Well, that's telling me right off the bat that we're going to have a little trouble with doing exposure with poor Sweetie. So, so you have to work with that in the midst of your treatment. So 14 week, uh, week treatment, 12 sessions, a transfer of control model. I'm teaching the parents to do this treatment with their kids. Penn, Duke, and Brown again, usual suspects, Jeff Cepeda, Jennifer Freeman, and myself. Roughly even split gender-wise, kids are on average about seven. Mean age of onset of OCD about five. This is an early onset group. Um, and we had about 42% uh, in the five to six-year-old range. 90% Caucasians who were chipping away, but we're still not getting where we want to in terms of representativeness. Outcome. Why box again? Not a lot out of relaxation, but a whole heck of a lot out of CBT. It's a really nice outcome. We're talking about 12 on the Y box, or maybe even a little lower than that. It's pretty darn good. We were delighted by this. We're also delighted by this one, which is functional impairment running the same direction. And you know, how, how hard is it to be functionally impaired when you're seven? I mean, you don't have a lot of things you have to do, but we, we saw some direction to this as well. So CBT was better than relaxation in both. I like this little one. So this trial's been published in JAMA. The secondary papers are still under review. Anyone who's ever submitted a, a paper to a journal knows what this process is like. Transportability, generalizability. I've got treatments at work in the hands of experts. So what? Most people can't access these places. Most people can't afford these places. How does it work outside of the hands of experts? We did a ton of this work in adults, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, looking at how the people in our open clinic responded relative to the people in randomized trials. They did fine, if not even better, but that's still an issue of expertise. So if Edna Foe and Michael Kozak are your supervisors, then how well is that generalized to uh, places where that's not the case? So, the one we want to know. So we picked Norway. Norway is um, remote. Anyone ever been to Norway? Help people? It's remote. Central Norway is remote. You're getting, you're getting places on skis sometimes. And there's, there's not a lot of people. I, I was recently in a place called Tromsø, which is way at the top, way past the Arctic Circle. There is not a lot going on up there. Very remote, and 50% of the town is government workers. Government workers associated with the oil industry, because there's a whole heck of a lot of oil off the coast, and they want to harvest that oil. They're actually one of the richest nations in the world now because of that. So, remote, not a lot of access to expertise. There's some experts in Oslo, which is way in the south, but we want to look at, see how this looks outside of that context. This is a John Passantini-inspired study. Uh, this is a picture of Bergen, which is beautiful. It's chilly. 
I, I sent a, a horrible text to my family last night saying, you know, it's a little muggy for my jacket. They're in, they're in Pennsylvania. It's like minus five degrees. I got a lot of comments about what I could do with my suffering. Especially for my teenager. Be very consistent. So, Robert Valderhog does a study looking at the comparison to our own, the CTSA, the, the, the POTS pilot study. He's got master's level clinicians who are being supervised by people who have access to the expert supervisor, Passantini. So it's a supervision of supervisors study. Passantini has nothing to do with the direct clinical service given by these master's level clinicians. He does as well as we did. Very encouraging. So, where do we go from there? We've got a number of them now. There's some in Australia. There's one in England that just came out. There's the Nordlots trial, which I'll show you as part of that. And then the National Implementation Project, which is the reason I go to Norway a lot. So, Nordlots. This was a study where we we're trying to look at partial responders. So the idea was give everybody CBT, gather up all the partial responders, and then randomize them to medicine, so add sertraline, or just more CBT. What's the best strategy? So we switch strategies, or we just do more of the same? Well, the, this is the phase one outcome. And the problem with phase one was it was too darn good. We had a 73% response rate, which ruined the second study. We, we didn't have enough power for study two. We did study two, and we got outcomes that were interesting, but is underpowered by, by about 60 or 70 patients. 73% response rate using the same model. I train them for a week, I leave, I have access to the supervisors, they don't use me much, and lo and behold, we get pr pretty darn good outcomes. And what's interesting about this one is that that red site is an expert site, and the uh, Gothenburg site is also an expert site. And so what you see there is, you, and you're looking at frontline clinicians versus experts, we all wind up in the same place. And that place is pretty darn good, like 9 to 12 on the Cybox at post-treatment. Very, very encouraging. 269 patients. This is not a small sample. Now we're looking at predictors. We're looking at a bunch of other things there. The phase two outcomes are published and basically say it makes absolutely no difference. If you switch to medicine or you stay with CBT, you're going to get a, a, a further 50% response rate. So both strategies are fine, which means if, if all things are equal, Maybe I shouldn't switch to medicine, which has all these side effects. As we say in baseball, tie goes to the runner. So if I see a, a treatment that's equal to another treatment that has a lot of side effects, right, then I've got to, I've got to deliver in favor of the treatment that doesn't have those side effects. So what's next? When you go to Norway, you get to see a lot of this stuff. Kind of fun. One question is age. I saw Bob talk about age. Um, and there's a CBT age effects page, uh, uh, meta-analysis that was published by Bennett. Uh, not, in, not in OCD, but just in anxiety in general. Because it would make sense that there'd be some age effects, right? And what we found from this, looking at this study, 17 studies, 1,100 patients, there was no age effect. Everyone was worried the adolescents wouldn't do well. They did fine, just as well as the little guys. So I think that one of the reasons that, that maybe we don't see age effects is because we've got experts doing the treatment. Developmentally sensitive delivery of CBT, which is not always easy to do. You got to talk to a seven-year-old very differently than you talk to a 15-year-old. And if you've got child adolescent experts who can do that, maybe you don't see these kinds of effects. We may see them in the other trials, which is why we're looking at this in Nordlots right now as one of our next moves. So for POTS team, we did three POTS studies running from 1997 to 2014. And our run appears to be over. Uh, so the question is, what are we doing next? One of the things that we're doing is we're looking at exposure quality, because we're interested in that issue. What, what is it that they did? And if a kid started to bail on an exposure, what did the therapist do? How did they respond? Did they let the kid out of it, or did they try to hang in there and try to find some way that they could continue the exposure. Because that, that's what I would encourage people to do. Family resistance to treatment, that's all getting looked at in a, in a grant that Jennifer Freeman and her colleagues at Brown are looking at. We're also looking at the 
moderator and mediator analyses to unearth mechanisms and see the, the, the quintessential question of who, who responds to what. Um, and I think that we are um, moving our way through that right now. Uh, we haven't found a ton of moderation, uh, but we found, we found some things that seem like uh, they might predict in the Nordlots trial. We only had one, one condition. Family factors, looking at a combination, looking at family history. Family history is actually a moderator. We found that in a POTS-1 moderator paper. If you had a family history of OCD, you were much less likely to respond to CBT alone, which is interesting. Because it, it would imply that there's something about the environment still that we need to modify. And Phil Kendall found that one, once in one of his trials, family versus individual CBT using coping cat versus, versus a psycho, psycho ed supportive counseling condition. And it looked at, at, the, at the overall rate, it looked like individual and family CBT were the same, except if both parents had an anxiety disorder. If both parents have an anxiety disorder, you better be in the family treatment, which makes sense, because it's an hour a week. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do an hour a week, and I'm gonna send you home to a place where everyone's gonna convince you not to go to the party because it might be distressing. You don't need to go to practice, poor sweetie. That coach is, he's yelly, he's mean. We don't wanna, we don't wanna deal with him. So you can go next week. That, I mean, that, that's the kind of thing you might be facing, and, and maybe that's why that's, these effects are popping out. Also, we've obviously, with John Comer, been looking at novel dissemination approaches, web-based treatments for the, for the little kid version. We're also looking in our lab at response inhibition training, another, another potential way to move around the, the underlying mechanism of response inhibition. People who do compulsions have a hard time inhibiting their responses to anxiety. So if we can teach them how to inhibit responses in general, will that move over to um, help them with their uh, compulsions? We've seen evidence of this in Trick, and we've seen evidence of this in Tourette syndrome out of Doug Woods and Hanjo Lee's labs. So we're now looking at it in OCD as well. And the biggest issue, I think, is this transportability to community clinical settings. We need to do a lot more of this work. We gotta find uh, people in this country who will fund the work. Um, there are people in Norway who will fund the work. And I think there's a lot of that work that should still be pursued here in this country. It's a critically important issue. Because if you're lucky enough to happen to be next to one of the places or near one of the places that do this routinely, you're good. You're probably gonna get a good outcome. If you're not, we, we're not quite sure what we can do yet to help you. And I think that's it. <laughs>